Hello, and welcome back to the Wolf's Den. We are the Order of the Green Hand, here to bring some clarity to a song of ice and fire. In part one of our Why Catelyn Sucks series, we went through her second point of view chapter in A Game of Thrones. With Maester Lewin's assistance, she convinces Ned to go to King's Landing and become Robert's Hand, and uses that as an excuse to finally force the matter of John stating she will not allow him to stay at Winterfell while Eddard is away. So after some impressive performances by her and Lewin, they convince Ned to send him to the Wall. Coming up in this video, we are going to be examining more of Catelyn's actions in A Game of Thrones, which further support our claim that Catelyn is the worst person that's ever lived. So, as we all know, Bran is thrown from the Broken Tower by Jaime and ends up in a coma. Catelyn sits by his bed for a fortnight and completely ignores her other children, including the three-year-old, as well as her daughters who will be departing for King's Landing. What a great mother and a strong woman. Now, when John goes to say his farewell to Bran, Catelyn really shows her true colors. Lady Stark was beside his bed. She had been there day and night for close on a fortnight. Not for a moment had she left Bran's side. So John stayed away. But now there was no more time. He stood in the door for a moment, afraid to speak, afraid to come closer. The window was open. Below, a wolf howled. Ghost heard and lifted his head. Lady Stark looked over. For a moment, she did not seem to recognize him. Finally, she blinked. What are you doing here? I came to see Bran. To say goodbye. You've said it. Now go away. Part of him wanted only to flee. But he knew that if he did, he might never see Bran again. He took a nervous step into the room. Please, he said. Something cold moved in her eyes. I told you to leave. We don't want you here. Once, that would have sent him running. Once, that might have even made him cry. Now it only made him angry. He would be a sworn brother of the Night's Watch soon, and face worse dangers than Catelyn Tully Stark. He is my brother, he said. Shall I call the guards? Call them. You can't stop me from seeing him. So John says his goodbyes, and before he goes, there is one final exchange between him and the Stoneheart. I prayed for it. He was my special boy. I went to the Sept and prayed seven times to the seven faces of God that Ned would change his mind and leave him here with me. Sometimes prayers are answered. John did not know what to say. It wasn't your fault, he managed after an awkward silence. Her eyes found him. They were full of poison. I need none of your absolution, bastard. John lowered his eyes. She was cradling one of Bran's hands. He took the other, squeezed it, fingers like the bones of birds. Goodbye, he said. He was at the door when she called out to him. John. He should have kept going, but she had never called him by his name before. He turned to find her looking at his face, as if she were seeing it for the first time. Yes? It should have been you. Wow. What a charming woman. What kind of woman, A, completely neglects all of her other children because one of them is sick or dying, B, treats a motherless child with such vitriol simply for existing, even though he has never shown anything but kindness towards her own children, and C, when she finally gets what she wanted, and she gets to get rid of him, condemning him to a life at the wall, she decides that she needs to stop him by calling him by his name for the very first time ever before he leaves, just so she can get his attention, so she can tell him that she basically wishes he was dead. Now I know a lot of people are going to say her behavior is understandable, given the circumstances. Bran was her favorite, she hadn't slept, blah, blah, blah. 
But based on the fact that John was scared to even enter the room, and thought to himself that he would have cried or ran away when he was younger, it seems that this encounter is no different than every other he's had with her. Before John leaves, Rob comes out to say goodbye, and Rob can immediately see that something is amiss with John, and says, My mother? John, being the good guy that he is, and not wanting to ruin his last moments with Rob, tells him that she was very kind. She should honestly consider herself lucky that John is nothing like another bastard we know. So after everyone leaves, Catalan remains with Bran, continuing to neglect her three-year-old and her 14-year-old son, who is now in charge of Winterfell. Rob is forced to have something of a coming-to-Jesus moment with her, where he basically tells her that she needs to snap out of it and says that she needs to help him with Rickon and that she didn't even come out to say goodbye to the girls and Ned when they left. Then, Rob swallows his pride and tells her that he needs her help, which coincidentally is exactly what Ned asked her to do. Then, the library goes up in flames, Rob rushes off to deal with it, and Bran is attacked by a hired assassin. Now, we do have to give credit where credit is due, and Catelyn did step up big time here. She puts herself in harm's way to save Bran, and kudos for that. This, unfortunately, is the first and last redeeming thing Catelyn Tully does in the entire story. So, after Bran's attacked, she sleeps for days, and decides that someone must go to King's Landing, so Ned can be told about the assassin and what took place. She decides that she is the best one to go, which the others strongly disagree with. She wins, as always and sets out with Sir Roderick. He hates sailing, so they take a boat, and they arrive in King's Landing three days before Ned and the royal party. So Catelyn arrives in King's Landing, in a manner in which she believed was discreet, sends Roderick to go find out what he can about the blade the assassin was carrying, and is then summoned to meet with Littlefinger, where she talks with him and Varys about the dagger used in Bran's attack. She then spends the next three days with Littlefinger awaiting Ned's arrival in King's Landing. She shares the news of Bran's attack with Ned, and then convinces slash forces Ned to work with Littlefinger because she already told him everything before Ned arrived, and Ned reluctantly agrees. Ned then sends her home with some pretty specific instructions to make sure the North is ready in the event of a war with the Lannisters. Once you are home, send word to Helmand Tallhart and Galbert Glover under my seal. They are to raise a hundred bowmen each to fortify Mo Kalen. Two hundred determined archers can hold the neck against an army. Instruct Lord Manderley that he is to strengthen and repair all his defenses at White Harbor, and see to it that they are well manned. And from this day on, I want a careful watch kept over Theon Greyjoy. If there is a war, we shall have sore need of his father's fleet. So Catelyn rides north with Sir Roderick, and they stop at the Crossroads Inn to get rest and get out of the rain. She settles into her room and then immediately begins thinking about whether she should ride to River Run or the Vale. After some deliberation, she decided that she should go to Winterfell, back to her son's. Why she was even considering going to either of those places is beyond me, especially given the fact that Ned gave her five very important things that needed to be done to ensure the safety of her family. She then thinks to herself, it must not come to war, and they must not let it. She then goes downstairs to eat, sits down at the table, and begins looking at the men in the room. Catalan knew them all the Blackwoods and the Brackens, ever enemies, whose quarrels her father was obliged to settle, Lady Went, last of her line, who dwelt with her ghosts in the cavernous vaults of Harrenhal, irascible Lord Frey, who had outlived seven wives and filled his twin castles with children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren, and bastards and grandbastards as well. All of them were bannermen to the Tullys, their swords sworn to the service of Riveron. Catelyn wondered if that would be enough if it came to war. 
Her father was the staunchest man who'd ever lived, and she had no doubt that he would call his banners. But would the banners come? Tyrion then enters the inn with two guardsmen in Yorin, and even though she seriously doubts the loyalty of the men in the room, she seizes Tyrion, much to the dismay of Sir Roderick, therefore starting the war that she herself just thought not ten minutes before they must not fight. Still, having done none of the five things that Ned told her needed to be done in preparation for a war with the Lannisters. Then, to make matters worse, instead of heading to Winterfell, or at least the north like she just determined she should, she decides to head to the Eyrie, which requires them to travel through the Mountains of the Moon, past the Mountain Clans, which she just thought once again, not ten minutes ago, is too dangerous without a large party citing that even John Aaron used to only travel through there in quote-unquote strength. So, the question then becomes, what would have motivated this woman to A. eagerly rush to King's Landing so she could beat Ned there, even though everyone else is advising her to do what Ned told her to do and send someone else? B. after going to King's Landing and receiving new orders from Ned, seriously considers defying him again and going to River Run or the Erie instead. C. Not doing any of the things Ned told her needed to be done and instead seizing Tyrion Lannister and taking him through the Mountains of the Moon, starting a war that she herself just determined they are not ready to fight, leaving her husband and daughters, who she already said, quote, she let go of in her heart, which is a really strange thing to think, surrounded by Lannisters, with only a king that she claims she does not trust between them and certain death. Our money's on whatever was written in that letter Liza sent her. What exactly was in the letter, we could only speculate. But what we can say for certain is that she burnt the letter before anyone else could see it, which if it was written in a secret language that only she and her sister could read is completely unnecessary. The only logical explanation for her actions would be that the contents of the letter included information that she did not share with Ned or us the reader. It is interesting, however, that the first time that she thought of John being a threat to her children's rights to Winterfell occurred right after she read that letter. In summary, Catelyn is absolutely terrible to John, and terrible is most likely being kind. According to John, she used to make him run away crying when he was younger and has never called him by his name in all 14 years of knowing him. Ned gave her specific orders to help Rob govern the North, and she doesn't, nor does she pay any attention to the little three-year-old running around. She then does step up big time and saves Bran from the assassin, which she deserves credit for. But then she wakes up and decides to go to King's Landing, even though Ned told her to stay in Winterfell and everyone else in the room tells her there is no reason for her to go. She insists on taking a boat because she wants to beat Ned and the royal party to King's Landing, which I can't think of a logical need for, arrives days before Ned and spends those days with Littlefinger at his brothel, and tells not only Littlefinger what is going on, but Varys as well, both of whom she claims not to trust entirely. This forces Ned to work with Littlefinger, because he already knows and there is no way for Ned to go about his business discreetly and trust that Littlefinger will keep it a secret unless he's a part of it. Ned then sends her home and gives her five specific tasks that must be done as soon as possible in preparation for a potential war with the Lannisters. She heads back north, she stops at the inn at the crossroads, and immediately begins thinking about going to the Vale or River Run, neither of which is on the list of things that Ned said needed to be done. She decides that she needs to go back to Winterfell and her little boys. She then determines that they must do everything they can not to go to war. Then she goes downstairs to eat, looks over all the men, all of which seem to be bannermen of her father's, and has serious reservations as to whether or not they would answer the call if it came to war. In walks Tyrion Lannister, 
and she makes a grandstanding scene and seizes him. Didn't she just think that they can't go to war and knows that they're not ready because she has yet to do any of the things Ned told her needed to be done in case they do? Oh, Catalan, you didn't ever do any of those things, did you? No, I didn't think so. Sure, you told Rob to keep a close eye on Theon Greyjoy, but it was already too late. You had driven him crazy and he was never going to take your advice. All of that's going to have to wait till our next Why Catalan Sucks video, which is going to be put on a short hiatus because we have to finish The Wars to Come and get our video done with Tony Teflon on The Children of the Forest. So look out for those, and until then, stay tuned, like, and subscribe for more clarity on A Song of Ice and Fire, brought to you by The Order of the Green Hand.